Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are here with another segment of the Pine Bluff Commercial presents the newsroom. We are live again as we were last week. I am Byron Tate, editor of the Pine Bluff Commercial, and today we have Jimmy Cunningham with us, the director of the Delta Rhythm and Bios, Bios Alliance. Yes. Uh, welcome, Mr. Cunningham. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Glad um, to be here. You, uh, you and I have have uh, bumped into each other in a couple of places. I, re I remember when I was teaching at UAPB, you came and talked to the um, um, communications class uh, uh, faculty, and we yes. talked about uh, the uh, tourism uh, downtown with the different stations and what um, some of the, um, I guess, low points, you would say, in Pine Bluff's history has, as it has to do with the treatment of African Americans, uh, but some of the historic places downtown. Yes, yes definitely. Um, Anyway, welcome today. Uh, tell you. us what you do as director. You've been at that for, what, about a year and a half? So uh, no, long? I've been the executive director of the Delta Women and Bodies Alliance oh. ever since its inception in 2016. Okay. okay. And our goal has been to build out a travel corridor between Pine Bluff and Greenville, Mississippi. There are so many untold stories between these two cities. And what you have is you have one road, basically, which is Highway 65 South, which runs into Highway 82 East right. in Lake Village. Right. It's, it's, there's not, it doesn't even, there's no turnoff or anything. You just run straight, straight into it, and then you go over the bridge. Hop, hop over the Mississippi. And you're right in, in Greenville. Right. And the great thing about this stretch is that the music greats that are up and down this area, that have had some level of engagement, uh, the arts greats that have been up and down there uh, are enormous in terms of their contributions to America, but there hasn't been enough focus on them. Also, this area between Pine Bluff and Greenville, remember, Pine Bluff and Greenville are two of the historically largest cities in the Delta proper. So for music and particularly for the Chitlin circuit, that meant that artists were traveling between these two cities, going across the river and straight up the highway, stopping in places like McGee, Dumas, Gould, uh, Dermot, and other places headed to Pine Bluff to make money. So the Chitlin Circuit story is a story that deserves to be told. And what we've been trying to do is to organize all these cities on the highway so that we can have a corridor where tourists come from all over the world and they go from city to city and hopefully they drop coins and dollars in each town. Now, to this point, we have been able to convince the Arkansas legislature in 2017 to pass a bill that would create the Delta Rhythm and Bayou's Highway. That's Highway 65 on the Arkansas side. I've seen the signs. 2018, we were able to convince the Mississippi legislature to designate Highway 82 from Greenville, and they ultimately did a little bit further, but it works in our advantage, from Greenville to Indianola, mm -hmm. Mississippi, which is probably about 20 miles away from, uh, from Greenville, as the Delta Rhythm and Bayou's Highway. And then later, we were able to work with the city council in Pine Bluff to designate an area where there was a ton of art and, and magic through music uh, and, and other areas. We had a district designated as the Delta Rhythm and Bayou's District. We were also able to get the city council to designate a portion of Third Street as the as Bobby Rush Way, and we had a big spill for Bobby Rush and 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 you know several things. So we've had art exhibitions. We currently have right now at the UAPB Incubator uh, an art exhibition that uh, looks at all of the artists up and down the highway, but it also looks at 
uh, <clears throat> issues related to freedom because you can't tell the story of the musical blues without telling the story of the social blues. Uh, and so you know, we have a number of uh, images there. We've done other exhibits. The Runaway Blues is another example. Uh, we've done Catfish Soul and Blues Friday at the Incubator. Uh, we've been involved in a number of things and we continue to collaborate with uh, the Advertising and Promotion Commission along with the Jefferson County Heritage Trails Task Force. So, so a lot of times these projects are like, this is what we want to do, but you're saying this is what we are doing. This, that's this is ongoing. This that is, is correct. That is correct. So one of the things you have talked about a lot is cultural tourism. Yes. Um, talk, to, talk to us a little about that. There seems to be, I mean, that is, that's a big part of the draw, right, for it, it bringing is. people in, that there are uh, lots of people in the country who would follow that, who would, who would come here to uh, investigate that further. Yes. Over time, attitudes amongst tourists have evolved. Uh, going someplace years and years ago would have you know, been fine, you know, just something sort of artificially created, a miniature golf course or you know, a, a mini Disneyland or something of that nature. But what has emerged today as the biggest area of tourism is cultural heritage tourism. Cultural heritage, yeah. Tourists now want to discover stories that they never knew. They want to understand places and their contributions, their highs, their lows. They want to immerse themselves in what's unique about an area, especially as it relates to culture, and history. And so we have in our region and particularly in Pine Bluff, particularly in Jefferson County, an enormous untold set of historical narratives. We have done so much in the world, you can literally ask yourself, what would, Jeff what would the world be like without Jefferson County? and its contributions. And literally, you would have to take off dozens of things off the table that we have given to the world. But we haven't done a good job over time of telling our story. We haven't done a good job of creating interpretive sites that engage tourists so they can learn and understand. And so what we were able to do in having the city council to designate a district, and this is the beauty of the history in Palm Bluff. There's this one district, this one place in all of Palm Bluff where history sort of rushes into uh, the area like a, like a, a river and it just it, it is just incredible. In the district, the Delta Rhythm and Bayou's district, you have the story of civil war, civil rights, blues, cotton, slavery, music in general, the Chitlin Circuit, uh, cinematic innovation, all right. these things converge in the district and they open up these incredible opportunities for Palm Bluff to tell a story that no one else can tell. I, re I remember covering a meeting where, where you were speaking and um, I believe you said there are communities that take advantage of their stories they do. And, and they may have one or two or three and we have so many more stories, like way more than even a community that makes a lot of money, basically, yes. from their cultural heritage tourism. Yes. They have this many stories to tell, and we have this many stories to tell. That's exactly right. And just to you know, give you a quick example of one, Walnut Ridge. You know, it, Walnut Ridge is not known for much of anything. It's, I'm sure the people there are great, but they just didn't have something that was distinctive 
until they sat down at a table and said, we need to come up with something for cultural heritage tourism. They had one thing that was distinctive about them, <laughs> one thing. And that one thing was, in 1968 or 69, the Beatles were going from Dallas to St. Louis, and they made a pit stop at Walnut Ridge. Wow. They got out of the plane, they went to the bathroom. Now, citizens were alerted at this time. Of course, the late 60s, was, they were at the height of their uh, uh, popularity. But what, they, they landed, were, landed at the... They landed at the walk. regional airport, whatever the little you know, yeah, airport was. Airport. They just, yeah, yeah, they landed there and then they uh, you know, proceeded to go to the bathroom and they had been told, the citizens had been told, you know, the Beatles were coming. So every citizen that was in Walnut Ridge showed up and watched them go to the bathroom <laughs> <laughs> and then back to the plane. And then they took off and went to St. Louis. That was their 15 minutes of fame. That was their 15 minutes of fame, and they have milked it up and down because <laughs> now they have uh, interpretive sites related to the Beatles. I was driving down the street, heard NPR do a report on Walnut Ridge, on the top 10 places where you can get Beatles memorabilia, where you can see Beatles memorabilia. Oh and Walnut Ridge was Beatles. in the top 10. They do a festival. They have a Beatles park. And it's from this one little grain of a fact that they built out something that they have been able to pull uh, tourists and, and, uh, and have some great recognition uh, for. We have, I cannot tell you the number of stories that we well, have. Well, Elvis are, came by, right? Oh, I mean, <laughs> I mean we, have, we, have, we have everybody. We have people that have come here. We have innovations that have occurred. You wouldn't hear sound on film were it not for Freeman Harrison Owens, who invented the phonofilm. Uh, Nielsen ratings are the, uh, the invention of, or the development of Freeman Harrison Owens. Um, I, th there are so many areas that I could talk about in depth. Uh, and, and they represent, they, they are the bad and they are right. the good. This area, um, had an enormous contribution to reconstruction. The reconstruction era in Pine Bluff was really incredible, it, you know, in the 70s, 1870s and 1880s. Blacks were owning businesses and they were involved in uh, city government at a level that you couldn't find in many other places. And at the same time, following reconstruction, we began a series of lynchings here that accumulated to the point that Jefferson County is the largest major county, has the largest number of lynchings of any major county in the state. Pine Bluff had the largest number of lynchings by hanging in 1866 of any city in the nation. So you have these sort of this kind of yin and yang and you have the super best, the super worst, and sort of what's in the middle, and the crazy, and the hilarious as well. But it's all part of our very layered history, which is like an onion. Uh, and we can do so much with it. Uh, and I've seen other places that have done more with multiple stories. And, you know, they are, they are just actually doing fantastic. Clarksdale, Mississippi has branded itself as the epicenter of the blues. And folks come, I've been to festivals there where people were from Germany, Belgium. Really? Uh, Jamaica, uh, England, Canada. And, and they come, Clarksdale has about 10 festivals that have somewhere between 10 and 15,000 people that come. Do you know how many homecomings that is for us? Yeah, I mean, that's enormous. Yeah. That is enormous. So, so pick one of those pieces of cultural heritage, what, what you think might be the most popular, and tell me what that would look like. Well, uh, let me go to the plan. Okay, that, that, let's talk about your plan. Let's talk about the plan. Okay. Then. Talk about the plan. So, what we did was we went to the city council. We said, look, we have developed over 
three or four years, a plan as a trio. The plan includes, you know, Delta Rhythm and Bayou's Advertising and Promotion Commission and um, the Jefferson County Heritage Trails Task Force. We've put together something that we think can bring people to this area. It includes a, 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 a the largest blue outdoor blues memorial in the United States. It's honoring uh, about 50 individuals in this within this space where there is an amphitheater, a uh, a, a, a set of sculptures, art that is just amazing off the wall. And it connects to a, a wellness area. So we understood that tourists like to engage uh, locals. And so we thought, man, if we, could, if we could create health and incorporate music around it, we can have tourists and uh, locals to interact and engage. So that's a big stage right there across the street from it is our Chitlin Circuit stage, which is the large and smaller area. But you've got an area there that, uh, again, honors the Chitlin Circuit folks. And it's another stage for performance. Now, these all can be multi-purpose uh, areas, but they are splashed with, with color and with uh, uh, sort of paying homage to uh, individuals and sites that are no longer there. Uh, we have an area within this sort of uh, square that we've, this larger square that we've created that is... Uh, a cinema, uh, an outdoor cinema plaza. And then behind that we have a food and truck plaza. All this is where you can have your festivals, you can have engagement, we can even have um, additional museums, additional signage where we can, uh, we can bring living history into these areas where the art and the placemaking and the music and the movies and, and this is just in a subsection, a smaller section of the, of the district, we went to the city council and said, we would like for you to fund this. They, they agreed to fund this at a level of $2 million. Right. What they that you need? Oh, it, it, I mean, just for just six. for we needed six million for the, the just the carve out, the the square carve out. That's not the whole district. That's just that carve out. But what we wanted to do was about two or three things. We wanted to get a cultural uh, uh, engagement specialist that would help us do programming uh, in these spaces. We wanted to have money to start acquiring the spaces in the four block area or in the, in the four square area. And then we wanted to build out one venue. Mm -hmm. So the one venue, that would be the Blues and Wellness Park. That's the two million. That's the two million. Right. That's the two million. And so that's what we said to them. And not only did we say it to them, but I believe that projects of this size should be based on data and not just on feeling. Right. And so we went to uh, the city council and had a plan presented by a professional consulting firm out of uh, Philadelphia. And that firm's job was to look at the model and tell us how much tourism we could expect, how many jobs we could expect, how much money we could expect. And they came back. Who funded that? That was actually funded, the Advertising and Promotion Commission actually funded that. Uh, but when so they you, came you back. You didn't just come into the council blowing smoke. No, oh no, 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 no. This was, this took time and this took effort and when the report came back, it showed that over a 10 year period, the project was projected to bring in almost $200 million, $18.5 million per year and 250 jobs. 
And that, Mr. Tate, is just for the subsection. This, this the one small part. part. This one small part. It's not the entire component. Because we have something waiting in the wings even bigger. And that is, we believe, we've talked to the National Park Service. We've talked to National Park Service officials in Little Rock, uh, the superintendent of the uh, Central High uh, site, and also the superintendent for Ellis Island in New York who happens to be from Pine Bluff, Cherie Butler. We talked to them and we shared with them the vision for developing a national park here that would encompass both regional park and the peninsula by it, along with the Jefferson County Courthouse. Because all of that is connected to the Civil War story, the story of slavery, the story of Reconstruction, and with contraband camps and with a variety of other intimate details, personal details about people and places, we knew that this was unique, very different from other places. I believe there are maybe about two or three other places that have ask. contraband camps as their as national parks but to be able to build out as much of our story the layers of our story connected to the reconstruction era connected to those lynchings connected to the economic development that occurred in that period connected to slavery connected to the battle of pine bluff there's nobody else that has the layers when it comes to at least contraband camps that i've seen that our place does that that Pine Bluff does. We will if if our expectation, our hope was that we would have had time to put this together to to complete the planning for this, to then have a professional firm to look at that and say this is what we could do and or we could expect in terms of dollars revenue. Uh, in terms of potential jobs. Uh, I had hoped we would have that to the people before a vote on additional dollars for any plans coming up. Uh, but things happened so quickly that we obviously didn't have a chance to put that in place. But I believe if the citizens see that, and I'm sure that the the anticipated revenues will be even bigger than just our subsection that we're currently looking at. I remember I the city quite... council members were very impressed with your presentation. Uh, they said you've done your homework and uh, you know it's one of those if half of what he says is true it's still a magnificent yes. proposal. Yes, yes. Um, and the people, the people supported it. People yeah. came out to the planning right. committee meetings. Right. People came out to it the. It was packed. It was packed. Yeah. It was packed. It, there is a desire to get something done around here, no matter where it comes from. No matter who puts it out there, you know, a good idea will walk on its own. And right. I think people just kind of looked at, and we had videos, of course, the 3D illustrations, and uh, I, I was really uh, glad that people in this town liked that notion. Right. Uh, so you got the $2 million. Yes. Uh, and then what happened? Well. The, the wheels, if, not, <laughs> they, if they didn't fall off, they got a little wobbly. Oh, they got wobbly. Oh, we must have hit nails or something. <laughs> I'm not sure what was going on with the tires, but we heard screeching, and we knew there was a problem. So they agreed to give us the $2 million yeah. to fund it. They were in the process of preparing the budget for the upcoming year. And the next question was, where will this money come from? Where in 1. the budget? 1.9 million or something. Or yeah, one, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. 
Where is it going to come from? Yeah. Well, we wanted that money to come out of the new dollars for that the new five days since, since tax dollars for 2023. However, there were people on the city council, including the mayor. Now, now pause there. They voted unanimously to give you that money. They voted unanimously. There wasn't a dissenting voice anywhere. Okay, go ahead. Yes. So we wanted the money to come out of that 5 a cent sales tax, the new 5 a cent sales tax money. The reason we wanted the that money. The new being. The 2023. The renewal of it. The renewal of it. The 2023 uh, 5 a cent sales tax money, the renewal of it. Okay. We wanted that money to come because out of that, because we didn't want to have to deal with the entanglements and the complications and some of the um, challenges that have beset us in engaging go forward. We thought if that money is, and when I say given to us, that's kind of a misnomer. It's really given to the economic um, community and economic development office. So they would have gotten the money, a line item for them only, and they would be able to administer. Why through them? Is that just an arm by through which a lot of that kind of funding comes? The, yes, it is. It is. Much of the funding would... You for know, lack of a better place? Maybe. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And so we wanted that to be set aside. But that posed a problem. And the problem, though there were discussions about cash flow and other kinds of things, the problem was that this was going to set a new precedent. And that precedent was seen as, as a dangerous precedent. This would be the first time that any of that 5 a cent sales tax money would be out of reach of go forward. They would have nothing to do with any dollar of that money. That was, precedent. That was going to come through urban renewal, right? Uh, well, what they wanted, what the what the city, what what some of the city council members and the and the mayor wanted, was for that money to just come from uh, the surplus okay. that Go Forward had. All right, go ahead. Right. Sorry. And, and, and that surplus is in urban renewal, yes. It's in their line item. It's in their line item, exactly, exactly. So they wanted it to come out of there because that money would, if it came out of there, it would still be under the control, under the auspices, under the watchful eye of go forward and they could say yay or nay to anything because they were the signatories there. We went back and forth with the city council and they ultimately said, no, you've got to get this money. We've got to put this money under urban renewal and let go forward be over that. So, we said, okay, now we have to raise more money because that $2 million really is uh, a, it, it's just a start to even build out the venue. So it's, it's probably going to take about three, maybe $3.5 million. So we have to go out and look for additional dollars. That is A&P, Delta River and Bayous, and the Jefferson County Heritage Trails Task Force. We got to do that. But that was what occurred. Now, what was interesting to us was that we were told that if you, and this is in the, I think in December, when the city council meeting was going on and when they were talking about how this money could be allocated and kind of what was, what was up, they said to us, they said, if you take that $2 million, out of the uh, new money that's coming up, you're gonna blow the whole budget. 
You got cash flow issues. You got you, there's nothing that we can do to change this because it's just two million dollars is too big of a hit for us to to have in this, especially since you're not going to use the two million dollars immediately. I, I think the irony there was that where the money sat was not being used at that moment. It and, they found, and, but but that was okay. But if they gave it to you and you weren't, I guess, in the next 30 days writing $2 million in checks and using it right then, that was a bad thing. $6 million had sat in, a, in surplus for three or four years. It just sat. In fact, it was discovered when an audit was done by Bill Moss and George Steps. It was, the, it was brought to the attention of the city council. Guess what? There's $6 million sitting here. And that might have been in 20, in, in 20, 19 or 20 that that happened. But that just sat. So all of a sudden, we're being told, man, if you get $2 million out of the budget, <laughs> it's going to blow it away. It's going to devastate it. It's just going to be bad. <laughs> Well, we didn't buy it, but there wasn't anything we could do. But to add insult to injury, February came around. I believe it was February. And there was a proposal to fund the hotel, a portion of the hotel initiative. The city council, remember, had just told us $2 million was a problem and it would devastate the world. Chicken little, the sky's falling. But suddenly, $3 million was allocated to this. And everybody was cool. The sky didn't fall. Nothing happened. And life went on. Although I did hear that it irritated the urban renewal folks. Hey. Maybe so, maybe so, but if it irritated them, you have no idea what it did to me. I was livid. But I thought, this is the landscape. This is what we have to work with. And so we're gonna to continue to look for additional dollars and do what we do. But that's been a, that just has been a major concern. So it would seem that most of their irritation would have been the precedent that was set. Oh, yes. It, it, Obviously, it the money had been sitting there. The money there was sitting there. For it, that, a long, long time. If it was $4 million and not 6 apparently that wouldn't yeah. do much damage because the money had been sitting there for quite money a while. Been sitting there. But it was the precedent that we would take, go forward uh, money and hand, exactly. it, hand it to Jimmy. Yes. Because think about it, they, they knew the tax was coming to an end. It was, it was about to, you know, sunset. And they knew that there's going to be a, you know, a, a re-up or there's at least the, the public is going to go through a process of looking at what to do. They did not want a precedent to be set where someone else had had additional dollars, had done a good job with it, and they could make the argument that, hey, we don't need Big Brother here to help us do this. And so uh, they fought and they won. They won that battle. Um, so, But you still, I mean, you have had some face-to-face -face assurances from council members. Not that you can buy a cup of coffee with that. But um, they have said, we will, we will support you. Oh, we're not going to, this is not going to fall in a ditch. They have told us up and down that they support us and that they are, they're not going to let this fall apart and, the, you know, and we're going to make sure we're watchdogs that will keep ahead of things. But you're, you don't buy that completely. I don't, I can't buy that. My experience won't let me buy that. Let me tell you why. I'll give you an example of, of, of sort of the influence of Go Forward on the city council and why it's hard for me, even though well-meaning people say it, oh, we're going to do what we can for you. But still, 
If the wind shifted. If the wind shifted, it's the a whole different would shift. thing. So, so let me give you this example. Go Forward never did support this. Um, they, they were never really supportive of our plan, our district plan. I had talked to Ryan some time back. They, about, they would claim that they have been supporting this since oh, I know. day one. I know. But of course. Ahead. Of course. Of course. <laughs> they had this reinvent Pine Bluff, re reinvent downtown initiative. Early on, Ryan did call me. Dr. Watley called me and said, hey, we've got a, we're trying to build out some cultural stuff. This was the very beginning of the tax. I didn't support the tax when it was passed the first time, but I wanted to be a contributor to anything that was going to be built out. This is my town. So I came, uh, we, we, we talked, and they brought in an urban renewal uh, consultant out of Northwest Arkansas. He sat down with me and I sat down with the students. I talked to them about the history of the area because they were looking at how do we create programming? How do we create something cultural in the downtown area? But they needed to know the story. They needed to know the narratives and they didn't have them. So I talked with all of them. In fact, we did a tour around the city. Yeah. I went to sites and told them, hey, this is what happened here. This is what's going on here. This is why this building's here. When they got done with that tour, they went back to Fayetteville. And a few months later, the consultant at Fayetteville came to Pine Bluff and came to the community theater with a presentation of reinvent Pine Bluff. And it included the plan for downtown. And at that point, when I saw it, I was blown away. I could not believe they were going to put a music plaza. This was their plan. They were going to put a music plaza from 4th and State all the way to 4th and Walnut. They were competing plans. This, right? is, the, this is next to the railroad. These are, so what you, what you had, and they had these wonderful drawings of, 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 of you know, kids happily swinging. They were on swings next to the train tracks. People engaging uh, right by the train tracks. Not passenger trains, but cargo trains where coal or wood chips or every other kind of thing. So I said to him, we can't do this. This is not good. This is a public safety hazard, first of all, and secondly, are you kidding me? You're going to do a music plaza next to the train track? Who's going to be able to hear the music? Well, that didn't go over well with them. <laughs> that didn't go well at all. And I ended up having a conversation with them in, in a meeting. Five of us were in this meeting, including the consultant. And I told them, I can't support this because effectively it's crazy. And they said, I remember the consultant said to me on the phone, I know what's best for Pine Bluff. You all argue down there and this is part of that conflict. We're not going to let it happen. And I said, I will not be engaging you all anymore. I turned and talked to Dr. Wadley. I said, the, where you need to be developing is the areas where we have the history, not just on 4th Street. He told me that is not doable. We are not focusing on anything cultural north of 4th Street. Well, that is when we sat down with the trio of A&P, Heritage Trails Task Force, and Delta Rhythm and Bayou's and began to build out the plan. The plan that ultimately was accepted by the city. So Council. at that point, you and Watley were going. Oh, yes. Way. It was, it, it went just like that. It went yeah. just like that, you know. But those were competing projects. Uh, ultimately. At, at the, before, before they. Well, well it, see, they never could get any funding for the, for the, you know, 
tragedy next to the train tracks, the uh, plan that they had. They were applying for grants through the National Endowment for the Arts with the Our Town grants. They couldn't get any funding. They couldn't get any traction. And then I went to the city council and I told the city council, do you know what they're planning? And city council members said no, because they often don't see grants before they come out. Right. They said, and I told them what it was, and they were like, are you serious? And yes, that did create a big gulf. They, they didn't have a plan after that. After they abandoned the music plaza, they didn't have one. But we started building ours out. So when you had the standing room only at the council meeting, yes. that's when they got on board. Give or take. Oh, no, 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 no. It's, that's exactly when they decided this was a good idea. When they saw that the, um, that the community supported it and that the politicians were in support. Remember, at that planning uh, committee meeting, almost all of the city council members were there. Right. And they all wanted to raise their hand in support of it when it was, uh, when it was brought to the planning committee. So... Politically, you'd be out of your mind. So it was either get on Jimmy's train. Exactly. Or be left behind. Or be left behind. And they weren't going to do that. And so, you know, we, we took off and they jumped on. And uh, that's kind of how that, that, that evolved. Um, but I, I'll tell you something. It, it, it does, it bothers me. It, 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 there's something that nags me. When people say, well, if you don't pass the go forward tax, you don't have a plan. You don't have anything else. Yeah, I've heard that. We have worked on this plan assiduously. This plan is the only plan on the table that uh, has Revenue projections, job projections, and really that should be a, it's typically a standard when you're having economic development initiatives that require uh, infrastructure uh, development. Typically, you do have impact studies. What is the return on investment? Right. Those things are normal and expected in other places. So when we brought our um, impact study, we were following the legislation that the city council had passed, which said, if you've got infrastructure projects, you need to have an impact study. But it never, they haven't had to produce that. And so when people are saying, go forward has a plan. Well, they got a plan, but they don't have any data with it. They don't have any dollars to tell. They've got something that you can say, it feels good. It's just got a good feeling to it. Is that the way you feel about the 6th Avenue and Main Street plaza there? Yeah, I, I, I actually do. If Is that an attempt to, we got to build something so people can see something we've done? I, listen. When Go Forward abandoned their um, music plaza, they didn't have anything else big that was built in that they could show. Now, I want you to remember, they had this reinvent downtown plan. It had, we, the citizens paid three, over $300,000 for this plan to be built out. Almost none of that plan has been implemented now. One of the things that was going to happen with that plan was the development of Lake Saracen. Right. For them, I'm assuming at some level that might have been a piece, a cultural piece that they wanted to incorporate, but it never got I, built out. I saw one of the, uh, was at a meeting and somebody had actually resurrected some of the Here's what we're going to do with this tax. And there was a Ferris wheel. Yes. The, I, I'll never forget the Ferris wheel. <laughs> the Ferris wheel is the kind of uh, fantasy <laughs> that symbolizes so much of what 
that plan was. People were to live in these Jetson style ultra modern uh, structures next to the train track that, ran, that runs every 30 minutes next to two train tracks. There was an expectation that private developers were going to somehow bring uh, their money to, to build this out right next to these train tracks. What retired person, what person with, with means is going to decide, you know, staying up every 30 minutes at night listening to that train is something I've longed for for so long. Now that I'm retired, let's go do it. That's just not, that wasn't going to happen. And um, the, the plan itself just fell apart. It fell apart so bad that it stayed on Go Forward's website for years until the election. Right. That, the person it is who no brought it there. said it's no longer there. It's no longer no there. No Ferris wheel, I guess, in our No future. Ferris wheel and none of the other stuff that was, that was supposed to be happening. But let me circle back here. When we put our Delta Rhythm and Bayou's district plan together, we, we went to the Planning Commission. Planning Commission, we asked for a million dollars for this. It just so happened that Go Forward was finally catching up and putting something together because they needed to have something to show. That's the plaza, right? That was the plaza, right. exactly. So they went to Planning Commission and they said, give us a million dollars. Planning Commission said, look, we'll give, we'll, we'll, we'll give you a due pass, both of you, but we're not going to give you a million dollars. We're going to let the city council decide how much they want to give you. Okay, fine. It goes to the city council. The city council puts the stamp on it and they say, okay, yeah, we like it, but they weren't going to attach any money to it. What they wanted to do and this makes so much sense. They said, you know, between the plans, we see duplication. So what we want you to do is we want you to eliminate duplication. We want y'all to get together and meet, have a talk. Everybody, everybody that's doing stuff around downtown development, we want you to get together and make sure we don't duplicate anything. But what was really being said was, we got two big plans here and there's duplication. So sit down and work it out. We had three meetings. Go forward, didn't attend one meeting. I remember you telling me that. We attended them all. That was now, the plan to get together to figure out how you can get rid of duplication, but, the, but the other side didn't show up. Go forward did not show up. And so we ended up, the, the time elapsed after those three meetings and go forward Go Forward's plan went before the city council, uh, this time to allow some monies from that surplus that had been sitting for years to go to this project. I knew it was coming up, but I also knew that they hadn't, they hadn't uh, collaborated with us in order to come up with, you know, eliminate the duplication. So I called the city council member that had sponsored the resolution. I said, you can't pass this tomorrow because they haven't eliminated the duplication. The city council member said, I'll get with you later. And that was it. I never heard from that person. The next day they came back, nothing about duplication was discussed. Now, what is it that's being duplicated? What's being duplicated is we are creating a memorial park with an amphitheater. The amphitheater is going to have relief sculptures and art and everything else that celebrates all this good stuff, and it's an anchor in that area. Go forwards, 6th Street Plaza includes an amphitheater. Why is Pine Bluff paying for two amphitheaters two blocks away from each other? It's paying for those because Go Forward has had the 
ability to ensure that when they didn't want to conform to something, they didn't have to. And we're going to continue on building out our model. But because you got approval for that, because we got approval for that. That's correct. But you think we'll end up with two amphitheaters? Well, they've approved the Sixth Street Plaza. Now, granted, the amphitheater is right next to homes in their model. And I don't know how that's going to work in terms of noise ordinance. I don't know how that's going to work in terms of people being comfortable with concerts going on over there, right, just across the street from them, essentially. But that's an issue that the council will have to, they'll have to take up. Uh, but yes, that's what's going on. So last week, um, we had Mr. Watley in here and the mayor for a little while. Um, and I asked him directly ab about that situation. Uh, not, not the two amphitheater situation, but the supporting you situation. The, uh, this money, well, I, what I asked him was, it was not okay to give Jimmy Cunningham $2 million, but it was okay to give the Marriott Project $3 million. Right. So mm -hmm. along those same lines, uh, he, he defended what had happened, and he said, um, and even we are, we are on board with this, and we even have a um, mural going up. Um, but I guess he's misunderstood what that mural is because he, he made it sound like that was part of your project that they were supporting, but you, that's not your mural, right? No. I was shocked beyond belief. When I was told at a meeting last, just last week, must have been Thursday night, Wednesday, Thursday night. I think our Thursday was Maybe Thursday night. We sat with him. I was shocked when two people came to me and said, hey, I didn't know you were doing a mural downtown in collaboration with Urban Renewal. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, well, it's, it's, it's part of the interview. It's, you know, they've already talked about it and pretty much you'll put a price tag on it and everything. $30,000. $30,000. Yeah. I'm like, what? Uh, it's interesting. That whole situation is interesting. I think there's a desire to say some casual engagement created a collaboration. Collaboration is loosely used here, but they've used it. Let me explain sort of what the facts are behind that. Maybe two months ago, I was uh, contacted by the mayor's office. They wanted all of the entities that were involved with any kind of art to come together and to meet on the street and just kind of talk about what their plans were. So people would know, we wouldn't sort of be bumping heads, we'd all know what was what. It was, it was a great idea. So I was at that meeting, there were probably 10 or 15 people there, uh, representatives from the uh, Jefferson County Heritage Trails Task Force, from uh, UAPB artists, uh, there was a uh, Palm Bluff uh, downtown um, development with uh, Joy Blankenship, um, Chandra Griffith with Urban Renewal, Bruce Lockett. Uh, there were several others. There were several people here. And so the idea was we're going to all talk about what we're doing so we know and we're all sort of on one accord. Right. That's what we did. At some point, the urban renewal director said, well, you know, we, we want to we wanna contribute to the district, that is the cultural district. So, you know, we want to, you know, talk about what, what, you know, what kinds of plans are you guys doing and what kind of, uh, what, what is your vision for, you know, some of what you're doing? Well, we, you know, talked about, you know, we're going to have stuff related to uh, civil rights and stuff related to music and stuff related to cinema. And we had worked our way 
to an area right by the old looking good uh, store, corner of Third and Main. And Joy Blankenship was there. There was a mural already up. But, and that was what Joy Blankenship's organization had, had uh, uh, maintained over the years. But there were some problems in the wall and there was some fading on the mural. And the suggestion was maybe we can put something up here. And so everybody was, you know, everybody in the group was cool with that. Uh, I think the question, the question directed to me was, well, you know, what are you guys want to, what are you guys wanting to do in terms of what you're working on? I said, well, you know, we're, as I said, the area that we're doing is cinema and music. I said, if you wanted to put up individuals who represent those areas, that'd be fine. Because I'm trying to tell narratives. I'm trying to connect history here. And I still remember Ms. Griffith said, well, we don't do people. We're not going to do people because that'll, that'll create problems. If we put one person up, people will ask for another, and it's just going to create problems. And so after that, I left it alone. I mean, I just kind of walked along, and, you know, she and the art director, you know, talked about some bits and pieces, and then everyone dismissed. After that, <clears throat> I talked to Ms. Sherry Story, the executive director of Advertising and Promotion. I, though it had not, the email had not been sent to me, there was, there was a drawing that had been forwarded to her. And, you know, she didn't, she wasn't sure if this, what this was, was this a, you know, is this something that you guys are doing that's, that's your final draft or what? And there's an email chain to substantiate this. It's documented. And... I think Ms. Griffin responded that she, uh, she she wasn't in control of the final result. It was up to the city council. And that was all the communication we ever had. Then I found out last week that Dr. Wadley is saying that there's $30,000 that we've collaborated, we've engaged. You know, collaboration to me means... We're going to sit down, we're going to talk about the subjects on the wall, we're going to talk about the size and scope of it. Do we need something that's going to run forty dollars or $50,000? I don't know. But we had none of those conversations. Now, Urban Renewal was already going to do art. They were already looking at art before we ever got funded. Urban Renewal was already having conversations about art in the area. So when I heard they were doing something, I'm assuming... It's out of their budget. One of their projects. One of their projects. Just like Joy Blankenship, Joy Blankenship's work is out of her budget. When I discovered this last week, I knew one of two things had happened. Either Urban Renewal had taken its own money and had turned around in an effort to try to make a collaboration seem like something that it wasn't, they had then said falsely that that was our money. That was one thing. Or the second, which I'm believing more and more might have been the case. They took potentially $30,000 out of the two million that we have sitting in the bank or sitting in under their line item and decided that was what was going to be used for this project. We knew nothing about that. And let me tell you, when we went to the city council to get approval, we went to get approval for a cultural specialist, land acquisition, and one site. The Delta Rhythm and Bayou's Blues and Wellness site. That is on 2nd and State, and it extends over to 3rd and State. 
There's no money for murals any place else. We never not in talk, that two million. Not in that two million. No, no, none of that conversation was was related to anything outside of uh, that immediate area in terms of art. This sounds like a mess. It's it's. It sounds like they will spend your two million dollars on things that you don't have in your plan and say, "There you go, Jim." Well, uh, uh, again, what they're doing for me is making the argument more powerfully actually than I could right that they don't need to be the ones administering this because of the very challenges of complications and mischaracterizations and misunderstandings and politics don't think this wasn't this this was in part done to show before election that hey, something's going on downtown. We've got something happening. We, there, there's some engagement. And, um, Don't you think it's probably come out of your two million? I, I, I think it's highly possible how now you, that I can see it. How will you find that out? Do you, can you call the well, now, uh, Go Forward Bank and say, how much money do I have in my account? Well, it, it, ultimately, it'll end up showing up on, on some piece of paper somewhere, some kind of documentation. Uh, we'll have to go through the city and find out. If we have to go through, if I have to get a city council member to push this issue to find out where it is. We'll find out, but this just represents one of the many challenges that we have had in this process. It should not be this complicated, but it is. So one of the, the other thing that I asked Mr. Watley last week was your, your um, being nervous about this situation where the money is there and you're trying to do a project and Mr. Cunningham is afraid that go forward, i.e. urban renewal, is going to micromanage and will be hard for him to deal with, basically. Right. And, and Mr. Watley said he supports you 100%. I think that's when he said, matter of fact, we're, we're putting in a mural. Um, but, I mean, do you buy that? It, do, you all, do you all talk? Can you call him up and say, was that my $30 million? Or, I mean, $30,000? Or was that your $30,000? Because I didn't, that's not in my $2 million plan. Um, you all have those conversations? No, we don't. We, 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 we haven't talked much. It's not that uh, we wouldn't be available to have conversations, but... Um, over time, I have not seen a reason to trust uh, Dr. Wadley based on the based on how Go Forward has um, evolved, and based on even my engagement with him. I just have not built up trust in that way well it, they didn't come to your three meetings and now we have two amphitheaters right exactly perhaps it's on. it's it's all of it's all of those things sort of you know it's all those things sort of built in um all of this this is a small town it's not a big town why is our project seen as competition why would you not sit down with us to try to Work out ways that we could that we could come together and and sort of you know shape and frame this in a way where it's interconnected. It's a small town. It shouldn't be competition. It should be collaboration. I would but say collaboration is they have to control the strings. They have to control the power. And when you come to the table with them, you're in a position where you're having to ask for something or you're having to engage their resources in some way. But the, the, the notion of true collaboration where people just kind of sit down and we come up with ideas and we work together sort of equally in our position, that doesn't happen with, with Go Forward. Uh, I would it, say it, it has more to do with, or it has to do with them wanting to attach themselves to something popular and potentially successful because they haven't had a lot of success stories no. in, in 
in a lot of the things that they have no, tried. No, no, they, they, they actually haven't. Um, you know, I've seen them, you know, merrily uh, taking pictures uh, at the library uh, when it was first opened, and I've seen them at uh, various functions around, uh, you know, grand openings and, and several kinds of things. It's stuff that they're not necessarily leading but being connected to it in some way sends a message out to people who may not be as aware that this is a go forward initiative or that something connected to go forward is making this happen. I watched the interview last week where Dr. Watley talked about this $30,000. One thing that I heard though also that was not connected to this art money was interesting to me. It was the fact that they attribute their involvement, uh, I think with community and economic development for getting streetscape, that that, that was integral to streetscape. Helped them get a grant. A exactly, exactly. They were a collaborative partner with, I believe, community and economic development. I've done grants before and I've had collaborative partners and the principal or the individual or the organization that applies is the entity that gets the credit for that. Everybody else is sort of providing bits and pieces of support, but I would never say to someone I was the one responsible for getting that multi-million project, multi-million dollar project because I happen to be a collaborative partner. But yet they have, yet they, have, that they wear the, that crown. Exactly. And so, and there are people who assume, oh wow, the streetscape, that's, they cleaned up the bricks, they fixed up the roads, they put up the library. Uh, there are a number of ways that um, I think people could be confused about what Go Forward has done because in this period uh, that they've been working, there have been other projects going on. And those projects, in some cases, have been not been connected to them. So, this, we got a vote coming up. Yes. Early voting starts tomorrow for the renewal of the five eighth cent tax. Mm -hmm. It goes to go forward. Funds go forward. We also have a three eighth cent tax, which probably won't, we won't talk about today. But I'll just for edification. That's a uh, earmark for public safety. The first one sunsets, like the one now. Mm -hmm. The second one, the smaller tax, is for uh, it goes on forever, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so early voting starts tomorrow and runs through Election Day uh, a week from tomorrow. So my question, you weren't, you didn't support Go Forward the first time. No. Do you support it this time? No. And I ask that because that project, even if, even if that money, if, if you perceive that the city council and the Go Forward board and Ryan Wild, if they've all been playing games with this money, playing a shell game, you know, Jimmy, where, where's my money? Mm -hmm. It's over here. But the fact that there's money there is because of that tax. Yes. So if you say bye-bye tax, mm -hmm. aren't you saying bye-bye to potentially some of your project or future millions of dollars perhaps? Well, what, I, I, what I'm saying is bye-bye to... Um, this kind of leadership that Go Forward has provided, uh, and this kind of model that has that fits under this tax, if the tax does not pass, the two million dollars is still in place. But the well, other two monies, million less thirty thousand. Well, now less thirty thousand potentially, <laughs> but the the two million dollars is in place. The rest of the money, we would have to raise that money somehow. What I think is we are able, as a city, we have the skills and the ability and the people to sit down and craft 
a new model which will incorporate the plans of the Delta Rhythm and Bayou's district and other plans that might be out there so that we can have a better, uh, more transparent process that folks will gravitate around. I believe that we have the ability to do that. Unfortunately, what has happened is we've been put on a fast track to this election. And, you know, as much as I have voiced my concerns about go forward, I have to voice my concerns as much about what the mayor and the city council did in fast tracking this. It is clear that this community is divided on go forward. Go forward has become a lightning rod among many people in this community. In fact, some might say the community really is you love it or you hate it. There's almost no middle ground in here. If you know your community has those kinds of divisions, what I think you would do, what would be smart is to help build consensus. You could take the time a year, a whole year from now, when the tax is scheduled to sunset. If there are misconceptions, misunderstandings about what Go Forward is, Go Forward could have the time to build out a case and, and clear up misconceptions out here. At the same time, people would have an opportunity to pull together all of the plans and say, look, all of the other plans and say, look, this is what the alternative is. Right now, if Go Forward wins this election, they lose and the city council and the mayor lose. Why? Because half the population is going to feel like you ram this down our throats and now we have to pay for it. And that's going to aggravate those divisions even more. To me, it makes sense even if you're a voter and you support Go Forward. If you know your fellow citizens out here are this divided, I would say to a supporter of Go Forward, vote no so that your citizens, your neighbors, your family members can have more time to digest this to divest themselves of misconceptions and, and have a better way to frame and understand this. They can correct, voters can correct what the city council and the mayor did by fast tracking this. And it doesn't mean those people can't turn around next year and vote for go forward again after they've, had, after they've given the community time to uh, digest uh, and understand this process better. And, and have some additional uh, discussion and dialogue around alternative plans. I don't think they've ever said why they are having this election so early. Um, some people have suggested, well, because the, um, I think the water company is, is wanting a 41% rate increase, so that's perhaps in the offing. Sure. And the um, school district here is looking to um, probably at a millage request. Well, the, the new superintendent right. has said we will have to have a millage increase because they want to build a new high school, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, some have suggested they want to get the go forward uh, tax proposal into voters ahead of those things. Yeah. Yes. Um, so what do you see? Um, but I think it's more than that. I think there's one thing that uh, stands out in my mind. If you have an election, you have a special election, like you had the last time. Special elections always, almost always, bring fewer people to oh, the polls. Sure, yeah. They brought fewer people to the polls the last special election. Yeah. 
And if you think that your project is divisive, you don't want huge numbers of people to turn out right. because your model from the last time around was that the special election gave us an edge because only select voters go to the polls with issues like this. Yes. A broader, more diverse set of individuals, particularly by income, will turn out in general elections, primary elections, but not necessarily with, um, with special elections. And I think they understood that. And I think that's a driver in why we're sure. now voting in May. I totally agree. And the, I mean, that's why you don't put a school millage. Um, well, school millage, school votes have, are in different times yes. of the year, but probably historically, because you don't want that to show up on the general election because you will get a bunch of people going, tax increase for the schools, no way. Right, and, that's right. Uh, same, same with the go forward tax. If yes. you brought out a thousand people who are just voting for president or governor or something, and they see that, yes. chances are they will vote against that tax. That's or, right. Or that's the fear. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, you know, uh, Vivian Flower said uh, that the legislature had put their foot down on that and that that was, you weren't going to be able to do that at some point in the future. I, I think, yeah, I think, in fact, it's supposed to end this year sometime, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Like the primary next year. I think you could do it on the maybe the primary and the general election, but that's it. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Enough with these special. Yes, elections. I'm glad it's coming to a close. Let's get people in, more involved in the democratic process yeah. when they typically come out. So, um, give me give me um, what 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 your project one or two amphitheaters perhaps, but what your project will look like hopefully in your mind in the next five or ten years. Well, in the next five or 10 years, we hope to have, we will have a portion of the district built out. That will definitely be in, within five years, that subsection that we're currently working on. But it's going to take us longer to do the National Park Service component because you have to go through Congress to get approval for that. So it's several steps, but we intend, we have such compelling history. I have no doubt that once the community sees uh, what the history is and what the benefits are from an impact study, they're going to support it 100 percent and we will be moving in that direction. The other piece of this, though, is just in the last since November, we worked with Windrock International to get funding for placemaking in four cities on the highway, uh, Gould, Dermont, McGee and Dumas. They're going to be able to tell Chitlin Circuit stories, music stories in their individual sites uh, as this grant allows them to build out planning for all that, architectural renderings and so forth, much like we have. Greenville is the other piece of this. And Greenville, we're continuing to work with them. But when you talk about five to ten years, I mean, we've got the support of their, of their mayor and their whole their political leadership. We want the other part of the sort of, I guess, the um, the other end of the other bookend of the corridor to also tell the unique story of the Chitlin Circuit and of the music in a huge way, in a big way, in a big splash way, just like we're doing here. So we're going to be working with, with them as well. Those but cities. Those cities, yeah. yes. And so those cities are already moving toward, we're already moving around a connection. In five to ten years, there will be sites up, there will be stories and narratives told, there will be untold uh, facts that will really knock people out. It will be a knockout corridor. We'll always have room to continue to grow because the stories are incredible. But in five to 10 years, 
You wait for this thing because it's going to be rocking. Are you using any high tech? Because I remember we talked about it, and you know, the if you can go up to a house for sale and hit a hit a code, and it yes. gives you a walking tour of that house. I mean, that's a pretty powerful tool if you could go up and see a presentation or a video or you know this is what this site looked like in the past or oh whatever. yes 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 we've 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 we're working with some people who are uh, specialists in augmented reality uh, there is an individual that is with the uh, arts and science center who's just been there a year now uh, I think his background is he came from crystal bridges and he has a specialty in augmented reality. We want people to be able to walk around our area, push a button, pull up their phone, and there's a splash of, of 3D uh, imagery that brings an area to life even more than what we have in the physical world. So that's all a part of uh, what we're doing. Right now, we have videos as well. We have the video series. Uh, Delta Rhythm and Bayou's video series that tries to tell the story, the, the narratives within the district. And, uh, and it, hopefully it helps people to understand the highs, the lows, the superlatives, the powerful pieces that are built in uh, that we keep talking about are really the building blocks for our cultural, uh, our cultural machine here, if you will. I meant to circle back with you and ask you about the National Park, um, yes. you, you took this to a couple of people that, that yes, you know. to superintendents. What, what was their reaction? They were, they were so supportive of this. They were totally supportive of this, especially after we showed them the videos, the documentary pieces that we've built out. One we've released to the public, one we haven't. But when they saw those, they got it. They understood. And the individual, the superintendent at Ellis Island, who's from Palm Bluff, she had worked on the Harriet Tubman National Historic Site when it was all in its development stages and moving along. So she was very familiar with reconstruction history and with contraband camps. And she said to me, she said, Jimmy, you got more to work with. You got more layers of story to work with than I've seen with anybody with the other contraband camps. I said, I know. And she said, you got to do this. Y'all got to run with this. How many like um, national park entities are there in Arkansas for that? I mean, there's the Fort Smith one. Well, you know, uh, you know, Hot Springs is a national park. The whole yeah. city is a national park. Um, and then Fort Smith has theirs. Uh, I think Arkansas Post yeah. is a national park. So there's not that many. There's not that many. The area at Central, Central High is... Um, See, there are... There are they're different layers. There are different there. layers. Yeah. There's a National Historic Landmark. There's a, a national park, uh, but it all falls under the uh, National Park Service. So whatever the distinction is that we can get at, at the national level, we feel like we, got, we can knock this clean out of the park. We're, we're, the, we're the place where the only conviction of uh, an individual for violating the Emancipation Proclamation occurred, where the first one occurred in the United States. We, there's so much history. I could go through a recitation of so many facts. You, it would just, it's just, uh, it's unreal when you peel back these layers and see what we do have. But the public uh, should look at Explore Pine Bluff, shameless plug, they should look at Explore Pine Bluff uh, to see the first video in the documentary series and we'll be releasing those every month so they'll get a chance to understand what the historical and cultural assets are in those stories. How long is that? The, the first one is about 14 minutes. It's longer than anything else because the others are about seven to eight minutes. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the Pine Bluff Commercial runs the Explore Pine Bluff features every Monday. Yes. I don't see why, if you all produced a story, if there was a, a story that came out that was that was an Explore Pine Bluff feature on that that we couldn't attach mm -hmm. a, a video. Yes, yes. Was it, that was already, okay, okay. Yeah, I think we, because the story came out. I mean, you guys, yeah. you know, covered the, the story. But, I've uh, forgotten we attached the video. Though. Yes, 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 yeah. So it's all, we're just a story. We're a city pregnant with possibility. We have what we need. We got to figure out how to get the plums and just pull them down. They're, many of these plums are low hanging. But if you got a, if you got folks fighting on the ground, holding your legs and taking you through hoops to get to the uh, the plum, if you got complicated uh, 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 people who who jump at the plum and tell you they got it and they they, they don't have it, it's a problem. But we have them, and we can make the comeback. And we can make, I'm so excited about the possibility of a comeback in this town. It's doable. And we have the stuff to work with. So we don't have to fake history. We don't have to create artificial stuff that doesn't mean anything. We got the real McCoy right here. And hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to work that and to take it to the level it needs to go. Okay. That's, that sounds like a conclusion. <laughs> that sounds like it to me, yes. <laughs> Thank you for coming in Thank today. you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, it's good, good yeah. seeing you. All right. Good to see you as well. We have one question concerning the Well, we've had $2 million allocated by the um, city council. Go Forward has verbalized their support for this, but we'll have to see what that looks like in terms of the reality of support, of embracing this and moving it to the next level. But $2 million has been allocated and Go Forward rhetorically has stated that they are for this. Did they um, ever say, because I know at first there was an ordinance passed that I think mean, Whitfield um, sponsored that it would come out of um, urban renewal, but then they said no, it will come from other means. Did they ever specify um, where the other means of that money would come from? It was going to come out of the out of the five a cent sales tax. The 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 renewed 5 a cent sales tax for 2023. That was all going to be new money, and that $2 million was going to come out of, out of there. That's what we proposed. But to ensure that the project stayed under Go Forward's hand, the mayor and the city council uh, passed a resolution that that would come from the urban renewal line item. I remember that Ivan Whitfield was up in arms about it because it had passed 8-0. Yes. And then suddenly it was not so popular. Exactly. Exactly. There was there, there were all these little changes and they had to there, there were some minute little things they had to go back and revote on and then finally as it washed out it just uh we we couldn't get that money set aside in the way that we thought it would be safe and, and good for the project. Me, um, Dr. Wiley also said um, the project is they have gone on for about 10 years now. Mm -hmm. They were already in contract and it was happening now. Yeah. Whereas, um, you know, that while the money didn't need to be at such an urgency um, for you, right. do you agree, I mean, with his Not argument on that? at all. Not in the least. The problem with that is what they explained to us in December 
was that if you have, if you take $2 million out of our budget right now, it's going to create cash flow problems and issues that wouldn't that will open up the floodgates and pour on us devastating our initiatives. But two months later, I think it was in February, they had a proposal for three million dollars for the hotel that wasn't even thought about in December, the $2 million for us was going to blow up the program. But guess what? Magically, magically, it was magically delicious the way they found $3 million and it never tore apart the universe. And they went on about their business. So, no, I don't know. They were, they were, just, um, they were just saying something for the moment. I would point. So, what do you think that goes back to saying that they needed to attach themselves to something that was happening um, successfully? Um, I think what, what occurred at the time, I think part of this is, you know, everybody liked the idea so much, they couldn't help but get on board. Uh, they didn't have the, the, the ability to stop the train from, from leaving. So, they had to get on board. But you know, it was just a bigger, the bigger issue was there was a precedent being set. We were asking for something that had not been done in seven years. And that was, we wanted money to come out of the five cent sales tax to go to an independent project other than go forward. God forbid that was going to, at least begin the process of the end of the world as far as they were concerned. And uh, they have been, they, I've even seen posts on Facebook where people have said, well, you know, the reason that uh, uh, that they're, they're, they're under go forward right now is because, and, and they're proposing this to be under go forward in the future is because uh, the city council put them under there last year. Um, and so, you know, it kind of feeds itself, but it's that, I think the precedent was the problem with go forward and concerns about a precedent change with the, uh, with the mayor and with some city council members. I think it's important to point out that, um, there was a, you know, read my lips, no new taxes, kind of a statement about the hotel. We're not going to spend tax right. dollars on this hotel it was. Until, right. until we had to spend $3 million in tax dollars on this hotel. That's right. And that's, that's exactly and right. And that's when they went and raided the uh, Urban Renewal piggy bank. Right. And, and, and it didn't create a cash flow problem. The question about a, cla a cash flow problem would have been clear if that was real when the $3 million came out. So... You know. Okay, let me ask you one more question. Sure. Uh, you are obviously outspoken about this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. Does that hurt you in the long run? Do you get pressure? Do you get pushed back? Do you get phone calls from people that say you should knock it off? Yeah, I do. I've gotten pushback from some places and some spaces that I expected and some that I didn't expect. I, but this is too important. And if, if we don't, if, if, if people don't speak their truth right now, I believe this moment is so critical that we literally are at a crossroad. I believe that one of the other problems with this whole thing, beyond whether they've go forward as, you know, gotten uh, successes under their belt with initiatives and so forth, but what I've seen is the money that they have gotten has been able to position them 
with influence, with an inordinate amount of influence on the city council, uh, with, with various politicians and political leaders, with, with business folks in the community. And I'm concerned that this is a political machine that is being developed. And if you feed that machine 30 more million dollars or 50 more million dollars, the votes of people won't matter because political leaders and others will be brought into the web. They will be beholden to the machine and individuals won't have the full representation that they think they have. That is, that's beyond anything I ever thought when I moved back here six, six or seven years ago. I would be derelict if I didn't speak out and speak to that reality. That's, that's, uh, that's a, a little like, or a lot like what Joni Alexander, formerly on the city council, has said about Go Forward, that um, the mayor doesn't really need the city council. She said, you know, we, we showed up to pay bills, and beyond that, we were excluded from plans and conversations and goings on because the mayor has go forward. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's, it's, this is, this is what a machine is. This is how it, it builds out, and it's happening right in front of us. And if I didn't speak out, if I didn't speak to this, I wouldn't rest. I can't just be silent in the face of this going on. And Lord knows the leaders in the past that I have admired so much, one trait about them has been um, clear. They spoke out in times where there was some Concern about backlash. There was concern about, you know, uh, what, uh, about their political positions. But their truth was powerful and withstood the test of time over decades. And we're better because people stood up when it wasn't popular in some circles to do so. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a spiritual person in that I do believe there is a force of God that will assist folks who try to do right. And that's the only way I can rationalize trying to walk through landmines. How do you think the vote's going to go? Oh. Right now? Was it like two to one last time? It, it, I think it was. I think it was like maybe 3, 000, 70 to 35 uh, percent. No, no, no. 65 to 35 or, yeah. or something like 70 to 30 or something like that. But not a lot of people voted. Right. Not a lot of people voted this time, though. See, back then, it was... Um, it was novel. It was new. It was unique. It was. It, it, it well, we was, had a Ferris wheel coming. I, you had you had the Ferris wheel and everything coming. It was just it was just a party. It it literally was like, you know, like like somebody coming in and and like saving the drowning you know victims. But now, because so many people don't see results, and because there the trust factor has diminished with many. The games that were played in terms of projection of progress and you know inflating numbers and showing this to be something that it wasn't, it doesn't work now with some folks. And that's creating a divided uh, electorate. I believe though that in my hometown, more folks are gonna see the light and I will bet you that 55 to 60 percent this time are going to come out against this tax. But they're also going to demand 
that we sit down and take the plans that are already on the table in some cases and pull them together and come up with a new thing that is vibrant and acceptable to the public. I believe that. Representative Flowers had that same thought, that there is enough time to put something together in time to pick up where this one is leaving oh, off. There's no doubt. There's, there's no question about it. We and, have, and you know, so many people have been left out of the process. I mean, you know, if you didn't get a chance to get on, if you weren't uh, a white collar worker uh, with a nine to five, and uh, you, you know, sort of worked odd shifts or anything, you didn't have an opportunity to sit at the table and say, look, I, I need something in my neighborhood. I mean, all this, you know, good uh, fudge that you guys are putting out here, I got street light problems, I got drainage problems, I've got, you know, uh, uh, crime problems or a variety of other things in my neighborhood. What can I have a voice? And the, the meetings weren't set up so that you could even engage no. those folks. And I think people on have purpose. felt left out. Yeah, on purpose, of course. And I just think people have been left out and locked out. And you can, uh, to quote Abraham Lincoln, I think you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. I think there are more people, the, the growing number of folks, uh, it, and I think that number continues to grow even as we get closer to the, um, the election uh, date. So well, I'm you, hopeful you that always, my, time, I mean, my time will do it. There's arguments on the pro side Yes. for this, and a lot of people will vote for it. Yes. Um, I just hope a lot of people get out and vote. Yes. And it's not just a, what? What's, what's up for election? You right. know, I hope, hopefully people engage and and uh, think about it. Yes. And, you know, I, it's, we've been through a lot in this town. We've had ups and downs. I think people see this as a, you know, I think the sense that we're at a crossroad is, is prominent in some folks' minds to the point that I think some people will get out and vote now that wouldn't have with a normal special election. So I'm sure there will be more voters than there were the first time. And uh, right. I think that's going to benefit the cause of getting a new plan and a new or, or assembling new plans uh, and, and old ones and moving forward with uh, with with progress. OK, I'll say goodbye again. All right. All right. One more time. One more time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Nice to have you. All right. Good to be here. I'm